Hello again. It's the first week of Advent. It isn't, but I cheat every year with our church and do five weeks of Advent instead of four because I love Christmas. And it also fits well with the sermon series we're going to be looking at for the next five weeks, which is uh, the unlikely ladies of Jesus's earthly line. So there's five women mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter one. And each of these five ladies for for a different reason would fit the description of being an unlikely candidate for being in Jesus's earthly line. So I hope that you're uh, prepared to study with me these next five Sundays as we go into the Christmas season here and um, find out some stuff. Why were these ladies put in this in this earthly line? Why would Jesus choose these ladies? We're going to read one today. We're, we're, we're starting off with a doozy here today. Uh, this lady, when I read this, this passage, you're going to say, what on earth was God thinking? <laughs> Um, but bear with me. When we study this out, you're going to find the hand of God throughout this thing. It's incredible. And so I just want you to be encouraged that God uses whoever he wants. God can use you and God can use me to execute his purposes. He wants to use us, as a matter of fact, if we're available and we'll, we'll allow ourselves to be used by God. So I hope that uh, that kind of sets the table for where we're going in this in this series for Christmas, for Advent. The unlikely ladies in Jesus' earthly line. Let's pray and then we'll dig in with the first one. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful that the Word of God has some incredible, amazing stories for us. Things that we might not have chosen for our, if we were the, the author of this book and of this of this life, we may not have made these choices. But Lord, your church choices are perfect. Lord, let us examine as we study today the life of this woman. Tamar, and uh, why is she included in the earthly line of Jesus? What is it about her that we can learn? And uh, Father, help us as you uh, take us through this Christmas season and this wonderful message of Christ coming for us, Lord. Uh, help us to discover some fresh truth from God's word today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, crack your Bible open there to Genesis 38. So we're way back in Genesis, so back in the beginning, the first book of the Bible. And we have a situation here where uh, one of the patriarchs, Judah, uh, is, uh, it's kind of an, we've been, actually this, this chapter lands right in the middle of the story of Joseph, you know, the guy that was, his brothers sold him into slavery and then he became ruler over Egypt. It's an incredible story. But in the middle of it, we kind of take a pause from that. And then you have this chapter here. It seems like it doesn't fit, but actually it does when we look at the character of Judah. So there's two main characters in this story. Judah, the patriarch, and this woman, Tamar, which of, of which there's very little information about her in the Bible. But we're going to mine the gold from every passage we can find about her, or most of them anyway, and see how these two uh, get themselves into the earthly line of Jesus. All right, Genesis 38. We've got to read the whole chapter, so we'll get sort of a narrative here, and then we're going to just kind of go through it and look at key parts. We're going to focus on the character of Judah, mostly, and by default, we're going to look at the, the character of Tamar. All right, G Genesis 38, starting at verse 1. We're going to go right to the end of the chapter, 30 verses there. Came to pass at that time that Judah departed from his brothers and, a, and visited a certain Adullamite whose name was Hira. And Judah saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua, and he married her and went into her. So she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. And she conceived yet again and bore a son and called his name Shelah. He was at Shazib when she bore him. He was at Shazib when he, she bore him. Then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. And Judah said to Onan, Go in to your brother's wife and marry her, and raise up an heir to your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his. And it came to pass when he went in to his brother's wife that he emitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. For he said, Lest he also die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Now in the process of time, the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. 
And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shearers at Timnah, he and his friend Hira the Adelamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So she took off her widow's garments, covered herself with a veil, and wrapped herself, and sat in an open place which was on the way to Timnah. For she saw that Sheila was grown, and she was not given to him as a wife. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot, because she had covered her face. Then he turned to her by the way and said, Please let me come in to you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, What will you give me that you may come in to me? And he said, I will send a young goat from the flock. So she said, Will you give me a pledge? Did he send it? Then he said, What pledge shall I give you? So she said, Your signet and cord and your staff that is in your hand. Then he gave them to her and went into her, and she conceived by him. So she arose and went away and laid aside her veil and put on the garments of her widowhood. And Judah sent the young goat by the hand of his friend the Adelamite to receive his pledge from the woman's hand, but he did not find her. Then he asked the men of that place, saying, Where is the harlot who was open, openly by the roadside? They said, There is no harlot in this place. So he returned to Judah and said, I cannot find her. Also, the men of the place said there was no harlot in this place. Then Judah said, let her take them for herself, lest we be shamed. For I sent the young goat, and you have not found her. It came to pass about three months after that Judah was told, saying, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has played the harlot. Furthermore, she is with child by harlotry. So Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. When she was brought out, she sent to her father-in-law, saying, By the man to whom these belong, I am with child. And she said, Please determine whose these are, the signet and cord and staff. So Judah acknowledged them and said, She has been more righteous than I, because I did not give her to Shelah, my son. And he never knew her again. Now it came to pass at the time for giving birth that, behold, twins were in her womb. And so it was when she was giving birth that the one put out his hand, and the midwife took a scarlet thread and bound it on his hand, saying, This one came out first. Then it happened as he drew back his hand that his brother came out unexpectedly, and she said, How did you break through? This breach be upon you. Therefore his name was called Perez. Afterward his brother Zira. Sorry, his brother came out who had the scarlet thread on his hand and his name was called Zira. We're not going to focus on those two boys so much as we are going to focus on their parents. All right. The late Dr. J. Vernon McGee, Bible scholar, said, I wish this chapter wasn't in the Bible. It's a terrible chapter. You might have been thinking the same thing when I read this today. It's like, what? This is in the Bible? Like, how? It's terrible. It's just rife with sin. And so I kind of want us to focus on these two characters, but I want you to get the impression or I want you to get this understanding today that God can use anybody. Anyone watching this, you might be saying like, I just, I made a lot of mistakes in my life. I've got a checkered past. I may even have a checkered present. You're not beyond the hand of God to work in your life, to change you, to draw him to, your, to himself and to use you for his purposes. There's no such thing as, uh, you know, a throwaway person. Our lives matter to God. Your life matters to God and God can use you. And this chapter is kind of a, it's kind of an encouragement to all of us. Like if the two train wrecks we talked about here, God could use them. My goodness, God can use any of us as well. I want us to focus on the patriarch, first of all, because he should have known better. Judah was one of the patriarchs. You know, he was uh, um, one of the sons of Jacob. Jacob was the son of Isaac, who was the son of Abraham, the patriarch that God had made the promises and the covenant that he was going to give the land of Israel to, to Abraham and his descendants after him. That's Isaac and his, his children. Jacob had 12 sons, uh, one of whom was Judah. Okay, so Judah makes a bunch of mistakes in here, and he should have known better. He would have been raised in the ways of God from his father and his grandfather. He would have known this lineage of faith. But let's... Let me take a look at a verse uh, that tells us a little bit about um, one of this. For, I, I've, so I've listed six things. There's at least six things in this chapter that Judah did that was absolutely wrong. Okay. That would make you doubt that he was a patriarch. You think, my goodness, this guy's just a terrible old sinner. How is God using him and putting him in the earthly line of Jesus? Okay. 
Let's look at the first one. First of all, he married a Canaanite woman. What's wrong with that? Look at verse 38, verse 2. Judas saw there a daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. The Canaanite man's name was Shua. And he had this daughter, and he married the daughter and went into her. Now, some versions speculate whether he actually married her or if he just took her, you know, kind of thing. So it's just a, a cohabitation thing. This woman was a Canaanite. Canaan was uh, from a land that uh, of people that were not of the Jewish faith. They did not fear Yahweh, the creator of the ends of the earth. Um, and prior to this, there had been a precedent set that uh, stay away from the Canaanite girls. They're going to steer you clear from God. You don't want to have anything to do with it. I can prove that by looking at a couple verses here. Genesis 24, verse 3. Uh, let me see here. Genesis 24, verse 3. Uh, where Abraham's talking to his servant, he says, uh, and he wants the servant to go and find a wife for his son Isaac. And he says this, I will make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites among whom I dwell. I don't want my son marrying one of the girls from around here. They are not focused on God, and they're going to steer my son away from that too. So that was what Abraham told his servant about finding a wife for his son Isaac. And then later, Isaac said this in, in uh, Genesis 28, verse 1, Isaac called Jacob, this is Judah's father, called Jacob and blessed him and charged him and said to him, you shall not take a wife from the daughters of Canaan. So Judah knew better. His grandfather, okay, was, had been, and, you know, was careful that to not have married a Canaanite. His father was instructed by his grandfather not to marry a Canaanite. What's he doing marrying a Canaanite? Canaanite was, they, they were fertility god. I mean, they just believed stuff that was completely contrary to the righteousness of Yahweh, of the God of heaven and earth, the creator of the ends of the earth. So that was his first mistake. Uh, look at verse chapter 37. It tells us a little bit about the character of Judah when uh, Joseph his younger brother got under his skin and under the skin of his other brothers. Uh, remember they wanted to put him to death. And then Judas says this, he's kind of a savvy guy. Chapter 7, 37, starting verse 26 says here, Judas said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother and our flesh. And his brothers listened. Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up out of the pit and lifted him, lifted him out and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. Sounds like he was being noble and sparing his brother's death, which is sort of true, but he was trying to make some money on it. He didn't care about Joseph. He's out of our hands. We don't have to worry about this guy anymore. So this is kind of the character of Judah. This is not a man that's walking closely with God, at least not at this point in his life. Okay, so we've already identified his first sin. He married a Canaanite woman. Um, second was, uh, he had made a promise to his daughter-in-law that he broke. Okay, so here's what happens. He gets a wife. So he and his wife probably get a wife for, for their firstborn son, Ur, this, this woman, Tamar. It doesn't say where Tamar's from. She may have been a Canaanite. Some scholars don't think that she was, but I, we're not going to speculate on that. We're not sure where she was from, but he finds this woman, Tamar. She would have been a young woman, that culture. She probably was a young teenager, okay? And they, so it's an arranged marriage, that Eastern culture. They find a wife and for their son, Ur. And the Bible doesn't mince words here. Uh, it says there in verse 7 of, of Genesis 38, but Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. Um, why was he wicked? How, what, what, how did he become wicked? Doesn't say what his wickedness was. Here's what I think. I don't think Judah was such a hot dad. That statement about him selling his brother, Joseph, a little earlier to the Ishmaelites to make some money, they didn't even make that much money off of him. Tells me a little bit about the character of Judah. He wasn't walking closely with God. And because he wasn't walking closely with God, he was not raising his sons to walk closely with God. I want you to hear me here. If you've got young sons at home or daughters, you're a dad watching this. You have a responsibility to walk with God, to be a man of the word, take your family to church, be a man of prayer. You need to model righteousness in front of your family. You know something, uh, that doesn't guarantee that they're going to 
embrace God with their whole heart. I mean, that's left in God's hands. But we need, as dads, we need to do our part. I don't think Judah did his part. Ur says was was wicked and God put him to death. I mean, how wicked was he that God put him to death? Okay. I don't think I don't think that Judah was such a great dad because Judah wasn't walking with God himself at this point. Uh, it, it gets worse. Verse 8, Judah said to Onan, that's the second born, go into your brother's wife and marry her and raise up an heir to your brother. Now, that's there's a law called Levirate marriage. What it is is if a, a, if a man marries a woman and he dies before he has any children, his the next brother in line is to marry his widow and have relations with her to raise up a child to be an heir for the deceased brother so the deceased brother has an inheritance in his family it's really a, a, a it's honor is what it is um we find out that onan wasn't all hot about that now that's, by the way I, I don't know if i'll take time for this but in in uh i will read a couple things here De deuteronomy 25 starting at verse 5 and going to verse 10 says if brothers dwell together and one of them dies and has no son the widow of the dead man shall not be married to a stranger outside the family. Her husband's brother shall go into her, have sexual relations with her, take her as his wife and perform the duty of a husband's brother to her. And it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of the dead brother that his name, dead brother's name, may not be blotted out of Israel. It goes on to say in Deuteronomy 25 here, but he won't do it. He's taken before the elders and they basically publicly disgrace the guy. And, and let it known, this guy was not willing to do the honorable thing for his deceased brother and raise up offspring. So they spit in his face and they take his shoe off and I don't know if they hit him with it, but they, they, he's disgraced. It, he, he's known in the community as a, a disgraceful person, dishonoring person. That's how big a deal this Levirate marriage was. Onan, the second born, should have done the honorable thing, and but he doesn't. But I'll tell you something, he probably had a, an, eye, an eye for attractive young Tamar, because this is what he does. Verse 9, Onan knew that the heir would not be his, and came to pass when he went into his brother's wife that he emitted on the ground. In other words, he spilled his, his semen on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. He didn't mind having sex with her. He just didn't want her to conceive, because he knew the kid would not be his. That's a wicked thing. That's a disgraceful thing in this culture. So he was... He was willing to have the fun of the sexual relations without the responsibility of doing the honorable thing of raising up offspring for his brother. And you know what it says? The Bible says, verse 10, the thing was, which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he killed him also. Okay, we're down two guys. We only got one left. And so Judah makes a promise to poor young Tamar. Tamar is defenseless here. This woman needed her husband. He didn't perform like he was uh, i'm talking about Ur here he was not righteous god put him to death his brother wouldn't raise up offspring for him so he's put to death so she has no husband she's widowed twice now and she has no children this this woman's destitute in that culture a woman like that is defenseless she doesn't have a leg to stand on so judah says something here he makes a very important promise to her verse 11 judah said to tamar his daughter-in-law remain a widow in your father's house till my son shelah is grown for he said lest he also die like his brothers now shelah doesn't say how many years younger he was than his second born he's probably not too far behind so we only got a couple of years two or three or four years to wait here before he's available to become her husband it's a little bit of a made of December romance but it's going to work uh it says tamar went and dwelt in her father's house now we need to i want to go back to this verse and read it more carefully because this verse tells us something about judah's character Here's, this, here's what I'm going to tell you. Judah had no intention of giving Shelah to her, as, uh, to her as a husband because he already lost the first two boys through this girl. And he's not taking responsibility for the fact that maybe you didn't raise your boys, right? Maybe that was why they didn't live. But it's like you got a chip on your shoulder against Tamar and says, listen, I'm down to one out of the three left. And if something happens to him, I'm not going to have any lineage. So look what it says in, again in verse 11. Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, he makes his promise to her, remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. But then he said, probably under his breath, lest he also die like his brothers. You can go and live with your dad for a while. We're not even going to talk to you or see you again. That's kind of what it was. Judah is not a man of character here. He does not really, he gives himself away by saying that. 
lest my younger son die. Well, I, I, I already struck out with the first two. He's not taking responsibility of why these boys were killed. Their unrighteousness, they weren't taught this. They didn't have a, their father wasn't a righteous living man so that he wasn't passing on this, this legacy to them. So he says, no, I got to, at all costs, I got to save this guy because if I, if, uh, if he dies, then I, I'm, I'm not going to have my, my, my candle's going to go out. I'm going to have no family line after me. So he breaks this promise to her. Um, that was, so, so far he's married a Canaanite woman. That was wrong. He, uh, he didn't raise his sons in righteousness. That's why two of them died. He's made a promise to Tamar, but he basically has broken it. So she's in her father's house. She's gone back home to live with her parents. She's wearing widow's clothing. She's got nothing. She's now relying on her parents who are getting older. And so now what's going to happen? Um, then it gets worse. Uh, after a while, it says there, um, verse 12, the process of time, the, de the daughter of Shua, Judah's wife, died. And Judah was comforted and went up to his sheep shears at Timnah, and he and his friend Hira the, the Adelamite. And it was told Tamar, saying, Look, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep. So his wife dies, and he's kind of like, oh, he's trying to get over it. And so he goes to visit his friend, who they, they share some flocks together. He's going to go do some business there, sheep shearing. And word gets out in Tamar's hometown, where, where Judah's headed, your father-in-law is headed back this way. Remember the one that promised you his third-born son? And that ship has sailed. Like, you should have had him by now. He's broken his promise. But you know something? He's. This is the time for you to make a move. Basically, the times we were saying, he's coming. But maybe there's an opportunity here. I don't know. We'll just, we'll just leave it with you. So it says there, uh, verse 13, it was told Tamar, saying, look, your father-in-law is going to Timnah to share his sheep. Verse 14, so she took off her widow's garments covered herself with a veil and wrapped herself. That's prostitute clothing. She covered herself with a veil, wrapped herself, and she sat in an open place, which was on the way to Timnah. She purposely put herself in Judah's path, but she veiled herself for A, so that she, Judah wouldn't know who she was, and B, he would think she was a prostitute, because that's how prostitutes dressed says, and why did she do this? For she saw that Sheila was grown. Some verses say, although Sheila was grown, she was not given to him as a wife. She'd had a promise given to her. It was her right. And, and that was defaulted on by her unrighteous father-in-law. And so even though she should have had Sheila as a husband by now, the first two husbands died not because of Tamar. She's not the problem here. The problem was those two boys and their sinful life. So here's Tamar. I can't live in my father's house forever. They're going to probably die before me. And I've got nothing. I've got nobody. I've got no livelihood. I, 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 need, to, I need to get hold of what was promised to me. So she stands in the way. I don't know that she was necessarily thinking it was going to be Judah that was going to sleep with her, but... When Judah saw her, he thought she was a harlot because she had covered her face. So Judah makes another sin. He has sexual relations with a woman who's not his wife. Okay, yes, he's widowed. That doesn't mean you just get to start sleeping around because your wife has died. So he has an illicit sexual relationship. So he says, when he saw her, he thought she was a harlot. Then he turned to her, by the way, and said, please let me come into you. That, that's nice dress up language. Let me have sex with you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. So she said, what will you give me that you may come into me? He said, I'll send you a young goat from the flock, which is in my previous, in my town where I came from. And then she said, will you give me a pledge till you send it? This woman's got, she's pretty smart, this woman. It's like, ah, uh, how am I going to know you're going to deliver on this? I mean, I'm not going to just put out for you here. And um, how do I know, know that you're going to send this young goat? I mean, I appreciate the young goat. I could use that. Uh, I need something. Uh, but um, how am I know, going to know that you're going to deliver on your promise? He says, I'll give you a pledge. So he says to, um, she says, well, what will you give me as a pledge to send it? And then he said, uh, what pledge shall I give you? She said, you're sick. So he asked her, well, what, what pledge do you want? And she gets really smart. She he goes, I'll take your signet, your signet, which was like a cylinder with your kind of initial on it to stamp legal documents. 
I'll take your cord, which was attached to the cylinder. Sometimes it was worn around the neck. And I'll take your staff, your walking stick, uh, which you never leave home without. It's kind of like American Express. So she asked those three, three things. Now, here's if Judah was a man of integrity, he says, oh, you know something, what am I doing here? You can't have those. The signet was something a wealthy man had. Judah was a man of means. The cord, the staff, these were all important, really, really important items of his. You don't just barter those things away. It kind of reminded me of what Esau, when he had the right of the firstborn, which is a double portion of his father's inheritance. But he came in hungry one day and, and his brother, Jacob, this guy's father, said, uh... I'm cooking this lentil soup. He's, oh, it smells fabulous. I'll have some. No, you won't. Uh, you're going to need to give me something for it. Ugh, what? I want your rights as a firstborn. And Esau thinks, you know something? I'm going to die here. I'll take it. Fine. You got my rights. It's crazy. Who would give up that much? It's like going into a, a corner store and you just got to have a Snickers bar. And you think, oh, man. I don't. And so you say to the proprietor, I don't have anything. Uh, here, Here's the keys to my car. Just give me a Snickers bar. You got the thing eaten in 13 seconds. And meanwhile, the proprietor has your car. I mean, it's ridiculous. For him to have given this woman as a pledge, who he did, doesn't even know this woman. He, For all he knows, he'll never see this ever again. He gives her his signet, his cylinder with his stamp on it. Well, the, the, the insignia of a, of a wealthy man. His, the cord that goes with it and his staff. These, these are important things of his possessions. And so he gives him these. He sleeps with her. He goes his way. She goes her. She goes home, puts, takes the veil off, puts her widow's clothes back on, and life resumes like normal. Wow. In Leviticus 18, verse 15, it says that one of the things that was prohibited in the law, which was written later, was you're not to sleep with your daughter-in-law, your son's wife. He had no problem with that. So it's, Judah is not walking with God. I'm painting a picture for you here. It's not a very good picture. We wish this chapter wasn't in the Bible because it's, 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 it's muddled and it's modeled. So she went her way. Judas sent the young goat. He gets there in the towns and said, uh, who are you looking for? All well, this prostitute that was in the room. There's no prostitute. No. He goes, yeah, sure there was. No, there's no prostitute here. You must be badly mistaken. And so, oh, so he retreats back to Judas and says, uh, the townspeople said there was no prostitute. I didn't find her. He goes, oh my goodness. Well, we don't want to be a laughing stock, so she can just keep the, the staff and the cord and the, and the signet, the seal, which is really valuable to me, but I guess that's the price you pay for a one-night stand. So he was actually, there's another thing that he slept with a prostitute, and he was more concerned about the sex than he was about these important, valuable possessions that were his, that were part of his character, part of his livelihood, he was able to just cash that in for, for, you know, for a season of sinning, as it were. Moses, in the book of Hebrews, says that he, he did not enjoy sin for a season, but chose to follow the promises of God. Instead, that's not Judah. He's a man of the flesh here. He's giving in to his own desires, and he's cashing everything in, and basically, I'll deal with that when the time comes. He's not thinking righteously here. Okay. The staff, of course, was a personal walking stick, and the and and the cord may have even been tied to it. So th three things may have all been kind of tied together. Um, there's another mistake he makes here. After it's found out that she's pregnant, word gets out, and it comes back to to, uh, to Judah. Your daughter-in-law is pregnant by harlotry. She slept with somebody as a as a prostitute, and she's pregnant now. And you know, he says something very very harsh. Um, there it says in verse 24 after they they announced to her that dot, dot, Tamar your daughter-in-law has played the harlot furthermore she's with child by harlotry Ju Judas said bring her out and let her be burned actually it's two Hebrew words take burn when someone was caught in adultery it was stoning burning them was amping it up a fair bit it was a much more torturous punishment than just stoning not that stoning is all that great either but to take and burn her alive was a very torturous thing. He's showing absolutely no mercy to her, not knowing he is the reason, he is the reason she is pregnant by harlotry. He doesn't know that at this point. And so this young woman who has no rights 
she took action to try to, you know, to basically get what was hers. And that it looks like it's going to just collapse like a house of cards. But she's smart enough to say, uh, just before you light the fire there and pour the gas on it, uh, I have these three items here. And if, if, if you want to know who I got pregnant by, it's the person who owns these. Go and find out who they belong to. Boy, she's crafty. And Ju Judah finds out, he's, oh my goodness, I don't believe it. This woman's more righteous than I. As a matter of fact, that's the words he uses. He says in verse 26, Judah acknowledged them and said, she has been more righteous than I because I did not give her to Shelah, my son. And he never knew her again. She had these, so he didn't have sex with her after that. She had these two sons. Perez turned out to be the firstborn. It looked like he was going to be the secondborn, but he shot through and passed his brother in the birth canal there. And he came out verse and Zira, um, the, the secondborn. I want to read a couple of verses here as we start to close this. Back in, um, or over in Genesis 43, this whole event, I believe, affected Judah in a good way. It's the chapter 38 is just a train wreck. It's a chapter that I'm sure Judah would say, oh, I'm so embarrassed. I wish it wasn't in the Bible. But you and I are learning from it this many years later. But there's a change of heart, I believe, in Judah. I think he's learned his lesson. I think he's turned a corner after all this that God has convicted him. I'll tell you why my theory is on that. Uh, uh, Genesis 43, verse 8 and 9. This is now we're, we've returned back to the story of Joseph in prison. He got out of prison. He's second in command to, to Pharaoh in the kingdom. There's a famine in the land, and, and Judah and his brothers are having to get grain. And, and they don't know it's Ju Joseph, their brother, that they sold to the Ishmaelites years earlier. They don't know that at first, just like Judah didn't know it was Tamar who was playing the harlot. In Genesis 43, verse 8 and 9, when, when um, Joseph demanded to see his younger brother, whom they left back home, Judah says this, Judah said to Israel, his father, send the lad with me, Benjamin, and we will rise and go that we may live and not die, both we and you and also our little ones. I myself will be surety for him. From my hand, you shall require him. If I do not bring him back to you and set him before you, then let me bear the blame forever. That's a different man than the one that behaved in chapter 38. He's taking responsibility here. He knows some severe actions got to be taken because they're under the thumb of this, this ruler in Egypt, turns out it's Joseph. He says, I will take full responsibility if anything happens to Joseph, or to, to sorry, to, to Benjamin. Dad, you can put the blame. Oh, don't even look at my brothers. I will take the whole blame. Wow. Pretty incredible. Uh, chapter 44, verse 30 to 34, after this sequence goes down there where, where uh, uh, Joseph decides he's going to keep Benjamin, not let him go back to his dad. He says, now, verse 30 there, now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, he's trying, Judah's trying to lay his case before Joseph. Said, Listen, you've got to let the boy go back. You don't understand. Our father's old, and this is going to send him, you know, to the abyss of death. He says, now, therefore, when I come to your servant, my father, and the lad is not with us, since his life is bound up in the lad's life, it will happen when he sees that the lad is not with us, that he will die. So your servants will bring down the gray hair of your servant, our father, with sorrow to the grave. For your servant became surety for the lad to my father, saying, If I do not bring him back to you, then I shall bear the blame before my father forever. Now, therefore, please let your servant remain instead of the lad as a slave to my Lord. And let the lad go up with his brothers. For how shall I go up to my father if the lad is not with me? Lest perhaps I see the evil that would come upon my father. He's now saying, he told his father earlier, I will take full responsibility. And now Joseph's saying, don't even bother to come back here if you don't bring you know, your younger brother. And he says, please, please, I'll, please let me take the place of Benjamin. I, I, let me, I'll be a slave forever. He's learned his lesson here. He's learned there's a cost of following God. He's made a lot of mistakes, but you know something? The guy's turned a corner here. I want to close this with one more verse. You're sitting here watching this message today and you're wondering, could God use me? I've made a lot of mistakes. You know something? I could have given you some stories here to start this, this message today. Some of the stuff I did that I'm not proud of, things I've said. I don't rehearse those things because I don't want to go back there. Christ has forgiven me of my sins, things I've done in the past. But I've done some a few dumb things that I'm not proud of. I've said things that I'd love to take back my words, things I said years ago. I'd like to take them back. I can't. 
God can use each one of us if we will, even where we're at right now, turn and start serving God. Tamar and Judah are in the line of Jesus because in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew gives us a genealogy of the life of Jesus. And he says this in verse 3. In fact, I'll start verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begot got Isaac. That's Judah's grandfather. Isaac begot Jacob. And Jacob begot Judah and his brothers. Judah begot Perez and Zerah by Tamar. This woman who had no identity. We don't even know where her background is. Does the end justify the means? What she did? She had a promise of a heritage that was defaulted on by the unrighteousness of her father-in-law. And so she took me, I, I don't believe the end justifies the means unless God's the one writing the story. I'm just saying this, there's a lesson for us to learn. We can be used by God. No matter what we've done, let's just bring that before God and say, God, I, forgive me. I made a lot of mistakes. I said things I shouldn't have done. I want to be used by you. Let me pray for you today. Father, we thank you that this story is in the Bible, as difficult as it is. This is a tough one, Lord. This man Judah was not a righteous living man, certainly not at that point. We see that he turned a corner after this. We see this woman who went to some very extreme means, not wholesome either, to try to get what she needed for her own livelihood. And yet, Lord, through this sequence of, of horrible events, really, Yet, God, you have preserved the, the earthly line of our Savior, Jesus, who's not ashamed to have these people named in his earthly line, as it's recorded for us in the book of Matthew and scriptures. Father, you can use any one of us. And I pray for anyone listening to this message today to know that all hope is not lost. Checkered past or not, even checkered present, it can all stop right now here. If we will surrender our life to Christ, say, Jesus Forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. I want to be used by you. I don't want to be living a life of sin. I don't want to be like Judah was there. I want to serve you and honor you. Oh God, I give my life to you in service. In Jesus name. Amen. You can go to our website. Drop me a note if that's something you want to do for, to investigate further to follow the Lord Jesus with your whole heart. You can change the course of your life just like that. Even with that prayer that I was just praying with you. Hey, we're going to look at another one of these unlikely ladies in Jesus' line next week. I hope you'll join us.